I don't want to start a street so I'm in here, so we'll go upstairs. <laughs> start proselytizing on the porch and shit. Although there's already a video on YouTube for that. Some guy giving a sermon on Van Franken Avenue. He literally is. He's got, it's like an illegal church service. He's got like his own amplifier out there, a microphone and some other shit. But here's the thing with music, there there is no um You know, there is none of that uh Oh this blackness, all this black shit. Dude, the black people give us rock and roll, hip hop, they give us all that good music shit. Okay. It's undeniable. Dude, I'm more than grateful for all the hip hop records I produced. None of them are famous, but I mean, they were locally famous. Black Kid knows that. He's gonna be like, What you got a studio in there, son? <laughs> what you doing in there? And, uh, that's exactly how it goes. And, it, and it's great because you can get on to, you can get on with people of other cultures, like, um, on the equal floor of just music. This guy knows this hip hop guy or whatever. Basically, he has a basic idea. I love working with hip hop people. This is why too. They hip hop people are hungry for for any any kind of content because they're not really some of them aren't really songwriters or musicians, but they are in the in the big picture. I'll explain how. And so you can, nine times out of ten, you just give them anything. And I have like weird eclectic likes and techniques. Like, I, I'm good with old school samplers. I mean, I, I even, I'm good with turntables. Because I used to loop that way. And so I just used to cut up anything I had laying around and I'd just be like, well, what about this? What about that? And I'll be like, oh my God, you mean I could have that? <laughs> and they, and it's great. It brings me back to the early rock and roll days when we used to just jump into the air with glee and be like, yes, we got that fucking song. And then you write your first one and then you're writing it with the hip hop guys and they just are so appreciative. You know, and you can guide them the whole stage. I used to work with them. I wouldn't be like other studio guys when they were coming to the end of shit. I'd speed it up for them. I'd be like, "Listen, guys, I, I don't want to have have to have you know have to have you run out of money and me sit on these tapes like that because I like what we did and I'd rather just mix it out for you. Come and finish it up. You know what I mean? And I'll I'll do all the hard shit because usually you got to pay extra for the mixing. You got to pay for this. I, I would just do it like I joined their band for a short term, you know? And then they come back time and they come back a lot. And that's how it's gotta be. But typically, um, you wouldn't meet the I would, but maybe you wouldn't meet these kind of kids across the way. I I my whole family was into hip hop deeply, as well as rock and roll, so I was able to from a young age get that shit. And I even had my own things, but um Yeah, dude. Although it's not like it used to be. I mean, computers helped wreck it a little bit. Because now <clears throat> you won't get this menagerie of found sounds. Like, oh, this is 30, this is like three seconds of Ornette Coleman. This is a two second sample of uh, uh, John Coltrane we threw in here. And here's an like 8-bit. And they're all crushed by and limited to your equipment. Now everything sounds so polished and robo-tastic. I mean, I'm not complaining. But it just, it, it makes me sad to think about all the old hip hop from from the, from the its early days, I'd say probably from mainly to, for me, 1980 to 1999, where it was just limited to found tools, found sounds, and the shit was exciting. I knew I knew change was coming on heavy when I first heard Public Enemy though. Probably I w it was 1988. I just heard it. I just heard uh, Security of the First World and uh, Fight the Power. 
I heard that shit on the same day I first heard punk rock. I think, and um, my, my my family had just got into it right around that same time. <clears throat> but we listen to different shit. You know, I grew up with lots of girl hip hop too, like LL Cool J, and just tons of that shit because I had sisters. And you know, every girl go goes crazy over Todd. What's his fuck from you know LL Cool J? I'm bad, nobody's badder. I'll take a muscle bound man, and put his face in the sand. People, lo- the girls love that. The jingling baby. Go ahead, Neil Bot. The jingling daddy. Go ahead, feel about it. That kind of shit. So, but, um, in my day, I used to record them with a, just like you'd see, like, on TV. I, you know, you get one shot to do it. I'd have a reel-to-reel. I'd have a tape four-track. And I'd have, like, you know, two microphones. And I would use guitar sampler pedals to, to trigger the samples. And they'd come out all 8-bit and fucked up and crazy. Yeah, I mean, but... And you know, most of the hip hop guys are so hungry. They 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 write too, like it's the la- they write for their lives, like it's the last time they'll be writing, because they don't get these opportunities to jam with the band, a hip hop band, in a studio every fucking day. They get it. That to them is is certainly their their mindset was like mine. Oh, this is once in a lifetime shit. We better explode like it's the last time. And they always you'll never see them come in. Well, we got this demo. We want a demo. We got this lazy demo with this loose idea. It's, it's never that way. They come correct with the whole fucking idea. And sometimes I'd have them. I'd have them where they'd write too many bars, and I'd be like, dude, this is gonna be a long song, because <laughs> um, they just come prepared, and then they'd sit there in the studio and just, okay, this is what I want. This is how it's. <laughs> this is the motherfucker right here. I got to condense now. This is the shit. And then you'll hear it, and you put it together, and you'll be like, I and then it would always amaze me. It wouldn't amaze me with the rock and roll recordings, because I knew, I guess I was too close to it. But with the hip-hop ones, when they would come, and they'd always come to a close, because you'd be forced, as a producer, you'd be forced to, to do shit on how they were doing it. So you'd have to make an end, and you'd literally have to make a middle, make an end, and make this thing. And it was always surprising to me. I'd be surprised, too. I'd be like, I can't believe I just did that. You know, not even thinking about the rhyme or whatever. Oh, and they would love it when they would hear their voice. I can't believe how clear and crystal clear. <laughs> because you put them through the Dolby or a, or a DBX compressor like I would use. You know? And they might they might have had a little bit of microphone skills and microphone handling and stuff. But when they hear it, you know, I'd give them a handheld even sometimes too. With an SM58. And just turn that compressor all the way up. They'd be like, "Oh God, it just—it sounds so good. It's an addictive sound. It makes you want to just record forever." And they're always eager to, to redo takes. They never argue with shit. They don't get that rock and roll prima donna bullshit where, "Nah, man, it's fine the way it is." It's like, no, they don't do that. They'll hear it. And they'll be like, "What's wrong with it?" And you'll show them whichever guy you're working with. I get—I'm thinking of a bunch of guys right now. And they did gladly, they, they would hear what, what wasn't working right. And if you had to go in, and when computers first started, and I started editing on one, I still kept it basic like that, but I would I would start doing shit where I would shift the, shift the words and flow. And some people liked that, some people didn't, but it was cool when, when I did it as a trick, they'd be like, that'd be impossible to rhyme that if I had to do it in the, in the reel, but it sounds really cool, we should just keep it on. I would do shit like that. And put rock and roll tricks in my, and I'd, I'd like sample shit for them. And I'd, I, I would take like an old animal sample of like, you know, a keyboard part, and I'd put it on there. And I'd be like, what is that? I never heard that, but it sounds so good. How did you think to know that? I'm like, I heard it, you know. I was thinking of, it was just ones that I was thinking of. Because people were sampling gay shit at the time, and I was like, that's gay. Or like making samples that sounded old, and, and it's just like, that ain't old. That ain't a real old shit. When I keep these on too long, my ear smells gross. <clears throat> Ew, ear smell. But, uh, I fucking loved it. Now I want to do, I, I, like I keep telling you, I want to find a little chick like like a, like Phil Spector and just, ex- just exploit the shit out of her like that. Because that's what people like. They want to see, you know, they want to see pretty shit. And they want to, and then if they want to, it's got to be relatable. Make it hip hop, because that that that's pretty much radio now. I guess I guess it's hip. It's not though. It isn't really though. Um, 
this guy is black guitar I played with these punk guys and I remember I remember once or twice we would do a Hendrix one just to break the monotony because it would be corny just there doing all this punk rock and I would I'd like to show off my skills and I remember uh, Billy Beer's brother rolling his eyes and shit it's like yeah you're rolling your fucking eyes because because you can't do this his guitar players might have been able to but they weren't allowed to that's the difference I didn't give a fuck uh, if somebody called out Foxy Lady I'd do it or something uh, you know I mean I couldn't help myself I'd be like all right this is my roots and, it, and I'll never forget that it pissed me right the fuck off because I'm thinking what First of all, if you don't acknowledge Hendrix as a guitar player, then you're not a guitar player, and you don't enjoy guitar. It, it, that's my thing. If, if, if that's a good taste test, maybe maybe rock and roll is not for you if you don't like that shit. But if you like guitar, you'll. I don't care if you play chicken licking country country picking up in a fucking mountain with an acoustic guitar. You would recognize Hendrix. I'm damn sure of it, okay? Because I grew up in this world surrounded by marvelous guitar players. You can tell, right? Okay. Well, I didn't get... I was like Robert Johnson. I didn't get, They thought I was annoying, and I sounded like shit, and I used to bother every one of them. I'd go... I'd chase them to all their shows. I'd try to play on stage with them. I would do... I, I admit it. But I went, and I learned my lessons like Robert Johnson did, and I came back, and then nobody could fuck with me. Because I had seen things as they truly were. I grew up listening to Buddy Guy... Gate Mouth Brown, I mean, like, uh, uh, who's the one who did, uh, I can't think of his name. I get a strong, uneasy feeling when I call you on the phone. That motherfucker, um, I'll come back, I, I, I forgot who he was. Uh, Robert Cray, Smoking Gun, he did. I listened to, um, I listened, I mean, I grew up on what my father had. My father used to like to get drunk and play and and proselytize to me these old tapes, and he would play for me Billy. Uh, I mean, just endless blues. I heard enough BB King that that it comes out my ass. I, I I've heard so much fucking blues, you don't even want to know. A lot of blues brothers too, and shit like that. I mean, just everything with guitar. And then my father had, had regotten his Robert Johnson collection that he used to have in the '60s. Back in the end of the 80s. And that was all we listened to for like from 1990 to 1995 in my house. That's all you would hear was. And I used to come home from school and be really. I remember having memories of coming to sleep and coming home to sleep. And I'd go to sleep and wake up with that record playing. You know. And that's and that's just the way it was. If you don't acknowledge black people. that I don't think you have a place in music. I don't think you belong doing music because, I mean, at least for me, everything I love was virtually created by either the Beatles or, or a sea of black dudes, and that's just the way it is. When you listen, I'm a do-up fan too, you know, so it's all black guys, and who gives a fuck, but there is a difference, and I mean, you, you need to understand that, so I don't think you're a rock and roll fan if, if, if that's your attitude, and that's unfortunate, you know, maybe you should go play sports or something, but that's just the way it is, dude. And, like, I, I can't express enough. When you're doing music, you don't see. You don't. I don't think there was ever a time I seen color. You don't see that. It doesn't. It never exists. Unless you're looking deep at the obvious details. Like, when you go to see Vernon Reed, you, you notice that he's got large fingers or something. And you be, that's, just, that's just human shit you notice. You don't think, oh, this black guy plays like this. It's like, no. Nah, it's just, it's a goddamn fact. I don't think there ever was any apartheid that existed in music. It, it's just... That's just not the way it goes. It's a lot harder for black dudes to do anything, even to this day. And with the popular music that's going. Most of them don't want to, and I don't blame them, because there's no real driver volition to do that. Maybe it'll happen again. Maybe it'll go into something else, but... When, when, when you're on YouTube and you're a musician, it's hilarious, because you get this vibe. You look at both people's or whoever's there, and you look at everybody's opinion, and you're just like, wow, a lot of them are so non-musical that it just... You know, <laughs> it's comical. It's, it truly is. But no. I mean, there is, I mean, it is nice to look at black chicks too, though. I mean, but that's different because they're girls and they'll always be girl, you, white girls, black girls. What's the difference? Um, <laughs> minor differences, you know? And that's why you like them. That's just me. That's how I live my life. But in music especially, it's impossible. I, I couldn't see, and neither should you be able to. But it is a fact. That's all black music. I, and, you know, it, 
it's a rhythmic music too which takes its place in Africa and the whole thing about music is to express yourself and that's an African proverb too is to always express yourself and I mean all the music is basically black it's rhythm dri- you remember the other day we were listening to shit I don't, and I'm saying well there's no guitar there's like no just sparse piano a lot of upright bass and drums but they're singing it's rhythmic and that's the shit that the church never liked about rock and roll or if they were around today they would say hip hop would be the ultimate devil they'd be like oh this this music's totally rhythmic there's no there's no three chords you know there's no um and a lot of this rock and roll has all those devil's notes in it because the whole music system was is based around religion threes and fours you know threes are perfect you know perfect or a five is perfect you know what I mean a lot of religious shit in in uh, theory in music theory so it's important you, you put your you keep your dick in the right shit but you shouldn't have to have your eyes open like that fully wide like that it should just it should be a fucking you know and I don't think that that's what that dude meant when he when he made that other song title I think he was talking about something else he's, like, he's got some whacked out song titles to begin with <laughs> 